Hello, everyone. My name is Kelly. I'm from Atlassian. Welcome to our first live stream. So today we are officially kicking off a new series. You might ask yourself why we're doing this. And the short answer is for you. We wanted to create a series where we discuss a wide range of topics around Agile and DevOps and bring along industry ex experts um, and then people like you. I uh, want to bring you along in the conversation. So um, yeah. I'm really excited to be, able to, uh, be here today. I'm going to give everyone a couple more seconds to get in, and I will introduce myself, introduce our guest, um, give you a little landscape of what we're going to talk to today, talk about today, and then we'll get right into it. So my name is Kelly Drozd. I'm a product marketer at Atlassian, but actually I have a pretty diverse background. I have a marketing operations background. I did IT staffing and services, sales and fundraising. But before starting at Atlassian, I led agile adoption and transformation efforts across marketing teams at one of the world's largest nonprofits. Anyone that has transformation or is responsible for agile and change management understands how large of a task that was. Um, so it was a really great experience. And I'm super happy to be here at Atlassian. Um, a little bit more about me. So I love complex situations and environments. Um, I'm a bit of a dreamer that likes getting energized by the vision of what could happen. Um, I strongly dislike the status quo and waste drives me crazy. And because of all of these things, I have really become an avid learner and an agile enthusiast. I'm a podcast listen to, listener. I'm always juggling audiobooks and reading a variety of things at the same time. Um, so chatting with someone like John Cutler today is really, really exciting and it's an absolute honor. So let's say hello to John. Um, for those of you that do not know John, which uh, I know a lot of people do, um, so John's background is in product management, um, product team coaching, UX research. He's currently the head of product research and education at Amplitude. Prior to Amplitude, John worked at companies like Appfolio, Zendesk, Pendo, AdKeeper, RichFX, and he's even a startup fond uh, founder. So John, if you don't know him again, John passionately writes and tweets a lot about product, and he can be heard teaching and coaching uh, around the world, which is awesome. So we're so happy to have him here today. So I would really love to say that we're gonna be able to unpack all things product today, but we're really gonna try to stay focused on what John calls the art of thinking big and working small. So John, before we start, for those that are tuning in that might not be familiar with you, can you share a little bit about product intelligence and the work that you and your team does at Amplitude? Sure. Yep. First, uh, super excited uh, to try out this format with you. This is exciting to be able to chat with you as well. Um, I know you were kind of working the, the cameras and sort of like involved <laughs> in the previous session we tried and to be able to chat one-on-one -on -one with you is, is really an honor. Um, yeah, so as Kelly mentioned, I work at a company called Amplitude. Amplitude uh, focuses on helping product teams be more impactful by using data uh, analytics. So we actually call it product intelligence because it's not just analytics, it's also how you take action with that data. Um, so it's an interesting space to be in. You know, I, I probably, my background, I would say, is sort of a product nerd. <laughs> so my my job is really great in the sense that I just get to interact with tons of teams all around the world. So doing coaching sessions um, and writing and working with teams. Now, I'm actually growing my own team now, which is exciting. So um, ideally, I'm going to let the sort of superstars on my team do a lot of that while I try to create a nice environment for them. Um, but that's that's sort of my role. So we at Amplitude, we think of education as an extension of the product. It's kind of all the product. So we actually have a product manager on our team. We have learning experience designers. So we really try to take this holistic view um, of what we're doing. And yeah, hopefully that's enough uh, background. I, th I think the luckiest thing is Amplitude gets to work with like just some of Atlassian as a customer. Um, <laughs> we get to work with just some of the the best product teams in the world, and then also teams that are sort of aspiring um, and, and in some form of kind of transformation or, or some transition. So it's really, it's like getting a snapshot of 20 years of, of product teams, you know, every week, which is exciting. That's awesome. 
Great. Well, thank you for sharing. So I am going to give kind of a brief landscape of the world for um, people that are listening in that have agile experience and worked in software development for 20, 30, 40 years. None of this is a surprise, but for those people that might not be extremely familiar. So I'm going to use something that John wrote recently to kick us off. So John said in an article that teams end up leaving their waterfalls and whirlpools to iterate nowhere in particular, no real strategy, no holistic end-to-end -end thinking. For them, it's a random walk punctuated by stand-ups and sprints. So I love that, John. Like when I was obviously reading a, a lot of your stuff, like I usually do, and I saw that and I was like, copy, paste. I need to remember this. This is really great. Um, so it's 2021. John, you reminded me this yesterday that we're more like 40 years since us, yeah. Way <laughs> software development, but this is the 20th year since the Agile Manifesto was introduced, right? So, yeah. you know, over those 40 years, um, teams started slowly moving away, sometimes very slowly, away from this waterfall type approach and started you know, moving away from projects and becoming more, more product organization. Um, adopting more agile ways of working, I'm using air quotes. So very generally speaking, organizations and teams went from these big bang, big launch approaches to finding ways to continuously deliver in more iterative, small segments of work. Um, yeah. So while the agile values and principles really changed the way that teams work and, and they really solve problems for customers, um, the mileage seemed to vary. Um, from what people are really getting out of Agile. I'm sure, you know, you just said you have you know, 20 years packed in, you know, your experience with all the teams you see. So I'm sure you feel this. I know you write a lot about best practices and anti-practices, but, you know, today we do see a lot of product-led organizations that have really put product at the center of the organization and the companies that have not, you know, they right. either just don't or they go through the motions of Agile without really seeing the impact or desired results from organizations that are more, more agile and more product led. So that's a little bit of background. So John, we're going to start to unpack thinking big and working small. So I know you have a great little, little sketch about this that, that breaks down the different types of work, so to speak. I think Ashley's shown that awesome. So the first one is working big, which you said takes forever. So can you just define what does working big mean? Like how does this actually manifest in the real world? Yeah. Um, so the the way that I think about it is, is to try to just get to the pure feelings and emotions that you have when you're, when you're kind of working on these particular efforts, right? And so, you know, when you're working big, just things just go at a glacial pace. And a lot of good things take time, actually. So so it's not just, it's not really about time as much as, as a sense of progress, right? And so I think we've all been in those situations where it just feels like a death march, right? It just feels like we're off in our own universes without any opportunities to kind of integrate our knowledge or integrate our progress or figure out whether we're working on the right thing or or just um, reality checking about where we are. So that's kind of how I would describe working big is in terms of the sensation, right? It just feels like this incredible batch, no sense of progress, incredibly large batch, and, and no sense of progress, no sense of um, learning, no sense of reducing risk or reducing uncertainty as long as you're working. And it just feels, you know, it feels like you're not going anywhere. And so interestingly, I think this is all very relative and this is what people don't um, take into account. You know, I, I was joking with someone the other day and they said, oh my God, I'm worried about this project being a waterfall project. And I said, well, talk to me about it. They're like, I don't know, it's going to take four weeks. You know, it's just this water. <laughs> like if you haven't been in an environment where you've covered a 70 foot wall with, with, you know, 70 printouts of a Microsoft project thing with, with massive dependencies of those things, it, it's almost like everyone talks about waterfall, but no one's really done waterfall. Like maybe waterfall didn't even exist as people normally think that it existed. Right. Um, but it's, 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 
it's funny how relative it is. So it's really contextual in your environment. So maybe for that person in their environment, four weeks sort of felt like that sense of like, you know, they had exchanged their their water waterfalls for a whirlpool. They just felt like they're going nowhere. Meanwhile, there's a lot of really impactful work that is going to take quarters and years. You know, and in, in those environments, you have contextually a sense of progress or you have a sense of no progress. So hopefully that I'm, I'm just trying to tie it to the emotions without talking about like time as an absolute in these things. It's it's more of a sensation, if that makes sense. Is it something that you can see from an outsider's perspective? Like, are there signs or symptoms that a, a company or team is working too big where if you were to say something or give an example, someone would be like, oh man, this is this is my team. This is something that I should <laughs> identify and start maybe approaching our work a little bit differently. Oh, I mean, you can tell very quickly just by asking questions. You know, you'll say like, um, you'll say like, what have you learned about your customers lately? So, uh, well, um, <laughs> not much. You know, or or you'll say, um, you know, when when was the last time you celebrated as a team? And th this is what I'm talking about. There's a, there's an emotion to it too. Like, wh when was the last time you celebrated as a team? I don't know. Like, you know, about three months ago, we finally got the one thing into production, but we're sort of waiting on this other team. And you know, so, so celebration, this sense of how how much you're learning. But I, I always use this word integration. Um, and I think people from an engineering background commonly think of integration, like you're integrating code, you're maybe putting it in an environment, you know, you're, you're, you're taking this, the threads or the branches or whatever, and you're combining them into something that's integrated end to end. And I actually extend the idea of integration to our understanding of the customer, um, to celebration, to many other things as well. Like, you know, if you and I are solving a problem, we each go out for three days, we integrate our understanding of the problem three days later. And then we understand kind of what we're doing with that. And so what you're really looking for in these big, the, the, the sort of working big environment is a lack of integration across many different types of integration, integration of knowledge, integration of technology, integrating with the market. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll, they'll say things. The funny thing about those environments is they're in a perpetual death spiral. They're so, so far behind the market that by the time they finally get the thing out there, they've already thought about the next thing that they need to build. So it's, it's these times of cycles you're talking about with working big. I, I think everyone, everyone watching can, can relate and understand. It's a little tough to put it into words, but hopefully I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I like what you said about uh, the question you could ask your team. When's the last time you got feedback from your customer? I think that's a great example of working big and into your example, if you're working on something for weeks, days, months, years, how yeah. are you getting feedback on like how are you getting feedback on it? And if you're not, like you said, did the market change? Did my customers change? Like a right. million things could have changed. So I think that's a really great example that you bring up. Um yeah, just does it feel sludgy? <laughs> <laughs> or, or just if it feels sludgy, that that's also great. <laughs> yeah, does it feel sludgy? That's a good thing. Cool. So we are going great. I'm glad that people can relate to that. Thank you. Um, so we're going to leave a couple minutes. Uh, we're going to do some Q&A in between. So are there any questions for John on the idea of, of working big? What that, kind of that looks like, that sludgy feeling, any examples before we move on? Awesome. John, are there, I, I have a question. Are there any yeah, that's great. Are there any upsides to working big? Well, I think we'll get to that. Right? Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I think that the th this is this is the thing that um, I mean, one one could ask like, why do we intuitively work big? And frankly, I I relate this to our own lives as well. Like, I always think it's hypocritical when the person comes in for the agile, whatever, blank, blank, blank. And then you ask them how they conduct their own life. And they're like, oh, I've been working on that book for 18 months. And like, I've been meaning to get in shape. And, you know, I'm thinking about going back to school or I want to write that screenplay, but I never write it. So like all these things are kind of counterintuitive to a sense, right? So the, the working big has definite advantages in some environments, right? If, if the only way you can get anything done is to pitch a huge project internally in your company. And that's the only way you can get the, you know, the CFO to pay attention or whoever's doing budgeting. And that's the only way you can get that effort blessed. 
then you're going to intuitively, there, there are many, many, many incentives in a corporate environment to work big. And that's, um, that's like, that, that's one of the things. So you, you mentioned the advantages. I think that the advantages are sort of first order, second order, and third order advantages. If you're in a corporate environment, there's first order advantages to thinking big. You will get a budget, you will get people to pay attention. And the funny thing is, is that no one really cares. Like by the time you ship the big thing, someone else has another big idea and, and no, no product manager gets fired because they ship the big thing. They're like, well, that person executed now on to the next big thing. So there's many, many incentives to, to working big. I also think what's important for people is the, the meaningful problems we need to solve around the environment and healthcare and even related to the pandemic are big problems. And that, that we'll get onto that with thinking big, but like the, the people whose environments, they, they don't allow themselves to think big kind of gets the problems we'll discuss later. So I don't know, there's a bit of a trade-off. Cool. cool. So on to the next. So the next is work small. Yeah. So talk about working big. Let's talk about working small. Define yeah. working small. How does this look in the real world? Yeah, so this is this is the sort of like agile scrum hamster wheel, as I put it. That like, hey, hey, you, how are you doing? Oh, we're a super high performing agile shop. I mean, we're like, there's points. You know, we're, it's all about the points. That burn down is just going like crazy. Uh, we everyone is super reliable and everyone's accountable and the team meets their commitments. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we, we ship every week. Ship is actually, we'll discuss that word. Like we put things into production every single week. Um, and so that's working small, right? So like working small. Now, now here's the thing about working small. Every one of these has sort of an advantages and a twist to it. If you have never worked small, working small is actually a huge muscle to build. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I worked in an environment where we went to one day sprints. So Ron Jeffries has this joke that if two week sprints are hard, you don't go to four week sprints, you go to one day sprints, right? And so, and, and here's an irony. I think there's, there's a book called Shape Up by the Basecamp people, whatever. And they're like, oh, well, sprints suck or whatever. You should work in six week yeah. iterations, which is ironic because originally like there was like scrum sprints, like scrum time boxes of six weeks. So, it, you know, when in doubt, bash Agile and then reinvent it, right? So, <laughs> so, the, so the, the, funny thing, the funny thing about it was that like, but in that book, they're like within one or two or three days of starting your six week thing, you have to put something in production and have something that we can hold. So the book wasn't saying <laughs> don't work small. It was saying just, you know, tackle something meaningful that, 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 that has some meaning over a period of time to do it. So working small is an absolute skill, like working in chunks that take you one hour, two hours and three hours or one or two or three days versus one or two, three weeks or anything like that is a skill. The challenge, you know, what I tried to do with that diagram is to say that like, yeah, okay, it's a skill, but then you see a lot of environments that have just hyper optimized for that skill and haven't taken it kind of to the next level in terms of their thinking. And so that's how you'd know you were in that environment. Every, you know, probably people would be pretty happy with what was happening. Yeah. Um, and certainly from, from a quality perspective, from engineering and other things, there'd probably be pretty high quality, right? In that sense that because you're integrating so frequently, you know, if there were problems you'd learn about. Now, the questions about architecture and other things like that, notwithstanding, like that's where you would feel. So hopefully that gives people an impression of, of working small. I'm, I'm going to go back to the advantage, the, the, the example of our personal lives, like, uh, working big is certainly, we all do that pretty well. Like I've got this big year long effort to do it. Working small also relates to us individually, right? You know, it's like, have, have you chipped away at something that you're doing? You know, are you like frequently doing something? So there's nothing inherently wrong with working small. It's just that if you stop there, um, maybe you're missing out. Yeah. That reminds me of new year's resolutions. I've actually stopped making them because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> making more things a little bit more manageable, right? Breaking them up a little bit, uh, yeah. making them more specific. Um, yeah. Awesome. So you talked a little bit about the benefits of working small. Are there, and I know you'll get to it, but yeah. 
you talked a little bit about potentially with working small or only working small. Yeah. Work can lack coherence. Things could feel a little scattershot. Are there any um, any other things specifically that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this this idea is it's it's all pretty it's all pretty fractal in the sense that like the original idea with small stories is that they should still meet these criteria of invest. You know, and so invest is like independent, negotiable, and value. You know, there, there's this idea of these little units of value. I think the thing that was missing in part of invest, which I'm sure people would agree with in some sense, is you know every every solution is or every problem is a nested solution to a higher level problem, <laughs> right? And yeah. so just just because you have something that's independently valuable, you could say this: oh, this is valuable for the purpose of integration, or this is valuable because a user can do a tiny thing that they could do that they couldn't do in the past, or oh, this is valuable because it's going to dictate the next ten years of the company's life. Yep. Right. So valuable is very fractal in that particular sense. So I think that the symptoms that you see in those environments that are only working small is that you, you could probably see in those environments that even though there's a sense of momentum, if you were to retrospect after, you know, six, six months or 12 months and say, like, what, what, what did we really move for the business? Yeah. You know, what did we what what outcomes did we really have? people really wouldn't be able to identify them. They'd say, well, we got a lot of little things done, but we weren't really able to kind of move things in a, in a meaningful way. That, that's probably the best symptom, you know, that I would, that I think, I think that the, the issue about cohesiveness is there's a tendency when you, you know, there's, it's, it's very common in the sort of agile world to think about breaking things into small work, but the people are really good at this. Think about these, you know, very, very thin slices across the problem space. And that's actually a really like great example of working small and thinking big. You know, like if you go across a particular experience, right? Or if you go across the problem space, that's a really good sign of like an integrative type of thinking versus sort of cutting up things into little pieces like that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, hopefully that gives a you know a good idea for folks. Yeah. Cool. So I think there was a couple questions. Ashley, thank you for bringing that up. So is there a risk of too much analysis? Oh, this is great. As a result of each small iteration? Yeah, I mean, there, yes. <laughs> and I think that this also is about, um, so, so there's this idea of kind of batch costs or, or, you know, switching costs or batch things. And so one argument would be if you think about a particular or like retooling or, or, costs. And so I don't know the exact word for it, but it's basically like one argument for working small against working small is that the transition costs between all these little small things creates a, a fair amount of overhead for the particular team. So you're kind of needing to get resituated. And there's actually like an optimal batch size that you should be working at. And that's how they think about it in manufacturing. It's like if the batch size is too big, you run into trouble. But if the batch size is too small, then setting up for each new batch is expensive. So I'm probably like butchering a lot of Kanban and like a lot of lean stuff. But I think that this question of analysis is if a team has these extensive rituals around every single story, you know, definition of done and sitting there and, ta you know, like tasks and, and they have to have meetings for every little bit of work. Well, sure. <laughs> analysis is going to be really expensive in proportion to every little small piece of work. But if you're able to lower the overhead of that particular like analysis or or even integration, like if integrating a piece of code into the code base is really expensive and takes a long time, people are going to do it less often. And so this is this idea of like you can tackle the problem one of two ways. You can make your batches big, which causes problems, or you can keep your batches small and address the symptoms and the overhead for getting each new batch into place like that. I've certainly known environments that by the time you added up all the meetings required to put like you know, 15 tiny things into a sprint. I mean, people are, they're, they're, you know, they're, they just want to go home. I mean, they didn't like, they didn't sign up for this to be sitting. I mean, no, if I've, I've spoken to Jira product managers and it's like spending all day in Jira is not the metric I know that you all are looking for because you use us right. for analytics and we've talked to right. your team. It's actually very, it's, it's about collaboration and that type of stuff. So yeah, we don't want to see so much analysis in proportion to the size of the batch. So hopefully that, I mean, we could talk all day about batch size, but that's what, what comes to mind for that question. Okay, cool. So there was a couple of questions on more of like the large view and then on safe specifically, but 
I'm going to hold those for now and let's move on to the next, which is think big, work small. So yeah. define this for us, John. Can you bring the picture back up again? Just yeah. so I'm remembering, I write it all at like one o'clock in the morning. Right oh, on. Sorry. Wait, wrong. I skipped it. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, this is the wrong. Yes. Thank you, Ashley. This is exactly why we have this. Define big, work small. I like how you, um, this is more slog in the internal burn down. Um, yeah. yeah. So so what this, is, awesome. is this kind of has like some of the, you know, people debated whether this was actually a step in these four things, but I think it really is, right? Because it's kind of like in define big, work small. Oh my God, that really makes your head explode, right? Because some this is the thing that says you walk into the company and they say, well, we've got 500 things in the backlog. We've already sized them. You know, we've already defined this massive big project and we're working in these tiny little pieces. So now you could argue, you could say, well, maybe it's just a big project. At least they're working small. At least they'll figure out if something isn't working. Right. But you have this, and actually I think this is related to the analysis question, oddly, right, that we just had, which is that like, in this particular setting, the direction is not thinking, it's not about vision, or anything like that. It's it's a highly prescriptive definition of what you're working on. And so I think I just threw that into the four to just respect that in some environments, this is the case where you walk into the company, and they'll be like, well, you know, we, we definitely take on big projects, and we're doing agile and whatever. Um, and and you're like, oh yeah, you kind of you kind of are, and then then all these sort of like anti patterns like slip out. You know, it's kind of like, well, they've got like I said, they've got the 500 stories in the backlog, or you know, they they have they spend half their time analyzing these stories and going through all these sequential steps to figure it out. So does that make sense? Like it was a little bit of a stretch to fit it in the three, but I thought I thought I should put it in there just to remind people that that exists. Yeah, I, I have a question. Now that we've talked about the three, right? Is do you see in in your experience the uh, that teams or organizations are just one one of these four things? I guess we only talked about three. One of these three things, or do they move kind of in between in between working small? I mean, you'll have different big, parts of an organization evolution. You'll you'll have different parts of the organization working in different ways. In fairness, yeah. to do these things, but. Um, I do think there's a little bit of a progression that I've noticed. I mean, here's one of the funniest things. I was at a conference and I met with one of the foremost XP mob programming, pair programming practitioners in, in the world. And he said, oh, I'm really curious about this product stuff. And I said, well, wh what do you mean? You don't have product management at your company? Oh, no, no, no. We are the highest performing feature factory in the world. You know, he was joking, but but he's not yeah. half wrong. Like, like in terms of like defects and quality and the practices, he's like, we are by all textbook definitions, the most agile shop in the world, but there's this whole other set of things that our company just doesn't think about yet. Yeah. Like we don't, we don't, we're really, really good at executing on these things. So I think that that's worth mentioning that like, maybe there is a bit of a progression here as people get into this you know, product led is definitely not product management led. I, I just think it's a belief that design technology can be this like force multiplier for sustainable growth for your company. That's, I don't put it any other way than doing that. And it takes designers, it takes uh, engineers, it takes sales, it takes the whole company to think that way. Um, but I do see that there's a little bit of this, I, you could say that there's a little bit of a progression across these categories um, to do things. And so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that they're, they're, the, the first one is just complete chaos. And then, and you could maybe even put that the third one's in second place, that they start defining things big and then working small. And then maybe they stop defining, you know, it's like, we don't need plans anymore because we're super agile. And then like, and then, yeah. So I don't know, there is a bit of a progression, I guess. Yeah, you mentioned, um, I'll just say this, I, mean, I know we have some questions. You mentioned that you've seen or organizations sometimes kind of separate these types of people or teams where you have this whole te teams that are that are thinking big that are working big and then you kind of have it split between the teams that are working small um but talk about 
you know, have you seen that in a way? And like, are there ways that an organization can repair that? And what do they do? Like, is it, is Whoa. it training? Is it bringing teams together? Like, how do you, how do you close that gap? Yeah. I mean, I think part of it is just the natural evolution of these um, business environments. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I always say that, you know, if you're a bank operating like it's 2008, in reality, you're competing against banks operating like it's 2010, 2006, right? Like it's not, you're printing money. Right. <laughs> right. So it's easy to say from like us, you know, um, you know, the, the agile consultant who says, well, I worked at this other company and they do all this. And, you know, yeah, the company, there's for a lot of these companies, there's not been like a strong pressure to change their practices. Mm -hmm. And and interestingly, but I, I don't know if this will help folks because I've thought about it a lot, but at Amplitude, we break up our customers into sort of three general categories. So the, there's these sort of rapid scale up startups mm -hmm. um, that are on their way to, you know, an IPO or they're big and, and, and there, there's a certain environment in those companies. And then you have these kind of tech companies that are 15, 20 years old plus, um, they're kind of trying to figure out their next act, but they're doing pretty well. And then you have these digital transformers, you know, these large enterprises. Now, interestingly, of the three, the, the digital transformers tend to, they, they get it. They understand on a core level that there's disruption in their industry. They understand that they need to change their ways of working. They have like a buy, they have buy-in. You know, they have buy-in. They're the ones spending tens of millions of dollars on consultancies and different things like that. And now they have so much inertia that it's difficult. Of all three, actually, I would argue from my perspective, it's the middle ones that are the biggest pain in the butt because they hubris is their problem. <laughs> they, 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 they believe that they're doing things like the best in the world and they're hardest, they're hardest to change just on a pure level and the startups are just chaotic. So I don't know how we got to this particular place, but I think context really, really matters. Yeah. And we need to respect the amount of inertia that exists in these massive enterprises to move across these particular categories. It's it's not something that, you know, if it took John Smart three years at Barclays um, to, to move to do a big transformation there, and, you know, he's one of the best in the world and he put that in place, you can imagine it's taking other companies, you know, a decade to do this. Cool. So... I'll keep us on track. Ashley, I know that there were a few questions that we held over that were more related to more on like the defining big work, working small. I don't know if there was still that safe question or if there's any more questions. So I understand there are different, there are different scale of things and is relative, but trying to understand what is the optimal number defined by small. Oh, <laughs> not okay. I, I can riff on the question, although I'm not 100 percent undersure to, to understand that. But like, you know, yeah, let's just get to the working small thing. If I'm in an environment where it takes even like one to three weeks to get things kind of in production or get things integrated, that just feels too long. You know, when I think about working small and, you know, th this is not just me saying it's kind of engineering friends and other people. It's like if you're working the scale of a couple hours to a day or two or three to kind of go through this loop of getting something, walking away and integrating it. That's a really good indication of working small, but super important at that does not mean you're done after three days. Right. So I think that's that's the thing that like some of these agilists are so dogmatic about this work and that they're going to get these things done. And, and, and really I have worked with a lot of teams. It is very hard to get anything meaningful done in two weeks. I'm just being honest. Like you can get a lot of like frills done. You can get a lot of little optimizations. You can get like a new feature into production, but to get something that you're confident about the outcomes it's creating, that it's thoughtful that you've done that, that, that type of chunk of work is not, in those one to three days. So hopefully that helps the person thinking about like when I'm talking about working small, I'm talking about these little cycles of integration and I'm thinking in this sort of one to three hours and one to three days range. But that by no means means that the, the thing that matters is done in that period of time. Right. Okay, cool. I think we have one more question. What do you think about safe? Oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> I well, think we might have to have a whole other story. There's, there's two funny stories about safe. So I, I tweeted this thing that maybe Ashley can even find where I'm like, I found the customer. I found the customer in safe. It's this tweet. But 
you know, so I, I found, I, I pointed this out on Twitter. And it's actually a lot of that were a lot of people are like, you're right. There's not even the mention of the customer in this. And what's really funny, I was at a conference and in the vendor booth area, and I could hear like the safe folks talking. And then they revised the chart to have the, like the customer just a little bigger in the center of everything. And then I heard the person say like, well, major revision this time around is that we've put the customer at the center of everything. And I was like, score, I need to get my like, you know, like I, I poke state safe. And anyway, that's like a say, so I, I, yeah, I'm going to refrain from the safe question because it's, it's so easy to judge these large companies yeah. from the outside. Um, and I remember, you know, M Martin Burns passed away, unfortunately, but I remember having long discussions with him and he was very involved in the safe community. And he would really talk me through his efforts to kind of organically generate this type of model inside these companies and the degree to which SAFE actually helped sort of bootstrapped what he was doing um, when he did it. Yeah. And, you know, I really, I really like talking to Martin and, and I think that it, it, I respect his perspective. So I think it's one of those things that's so easy to like, like I was doing is kind of make fun of this from the outside, but, but these enterprises are, are beasts to deal with. I mean, it, it's, there's so much inertia in this particular environment to do it. So ideally, you know, the, the question is how many of these safe environments are actually taking it beyond this kind of like dogmatic adherence to these charts and things and taking it to the next level. Cause I certainly hear people bragging about how well they do safe and, and that can't be the objective here. You can't stop at this kind of discombobulated set of value streams that are pulled together every quarter and expect that that's the end game for this. So I don't know, this is a complex question. <laughs> cool. Um, so just want to reiterate, we are super happy if everyone would just keep asking questions. If we do not get to them, um, we'll still, we have access to the stream. We'll be able to go on there and answer your questions. And we're gonna do a little write up afterwards where we can answer some of the most common questions um, so please keep asking. Um, don't stop. So cool. So that was great. I um, I have some experience, not myself, but seeing large organizations go through safe transformations for what is about ten years. So I do definitely understand the the complexity of extremely extremely large organizations and. They're, I think they're trying to do the best and their their change might be a lot slower than your your startups or a different company. So yeah, I, I totally get it. So avoiding that question or not answering it completely is a, is a good step. Um, cool. So the next thing is the last. Think big, work small. So John, you say that you consider this to be an art for product for product teams. So yeah. Can you define it and just talk a little bit about, you know, how, how you see it in the real world, what this looks like and how product teams essentially get here and, and have that balance. Yep, absolutely. So the, the idea here is that, so, so let me just talk a little bit about my motivations for, for putting this together and ending with that particular thing is that, the idea here is that strategy matters, right? Um, our, the vision of our company matters. <laughs> like the big picture matters when we're doing these things. And so the, the important thing with this think big, work small thing is, is that we have to, we have to, we can get the benefits really of both of this type of thing. So the think big is really about you know, thinking strategically, thinking in terms of impact and outcomes, thinking beyond the next six months or the next quarter. I mean, this is the thing about OKRs or anything, anything. As a product manager, you can do a million things that will please people in the next quarter, but will kill the company, right? That, that, that there's, so many dis, there's so many perverse incentives for teams to think in terms of short-term type thinking like this. And I think what's happened is, is that we sort of thought that like, well, everything, you know, we have to be agile, we have to do this particular thing. But in, in the process, we kind of stopped giving ourselves permission to think about the long term, thinking about sustainability, thinking about strategy and thinking about doing those things. Now, granted, I think part of the problem there is many the way many people interpret strategy is just as a plan anyway. 
which is basically define big, work small. Many strategies are actually define big, work small instead of think big, work small. So that was kind of the motivation here is to think about like, what does the balance mean between these particular things? And the reason why I say that it's an art is that it, it takes a lot of tweaking to, to shape these missions and sort of shape these kind of initiatives in a way that leave enough room for creativity, enough acceptance of uncertainty, um, enough you know, considerations about risk and that engage teams in uh, being creative and creative problem solving. That's not an easy thing. So it's really interesting when you go, um, when, you, when you talk to companies, you know, they'll say, well, we use OKRs. Okay, we're doing it. It's like, it's not easy. It's, and any, any CEO knows that this is the hardest thing. They want to give people these open-ended missions but they understand you need to provide enough context and then they know you need to create sort of enough guardrails on this to like keep risk under control and keep the team from just circling around to go nowhere. So I don't know if this is helping describe it, but I think, look, even as a, as a um, you know, when I was in, involved in sports or anything like that, I mean, coaches also have to deal with this a lot. You know, they, they know that you can do anything in this particular game. They know that you have to play for the whole season. So not to overburden sports analogies, but I think the same thing, the same thing. Plays. I'm not going to go there because I was about to. I really do like sports analogies, but I know that if all we talk is military and sports, it's just like you're alienating 90% of the people in the world. So, um, Cool. I don't know. Yeah. Do we have questions about this one? Yeah. Maybe I'll do better with questions. Ash said we have two really great questions. So are there iterations over the whole process too, in case of the fourth and separate iterations to try prototyping? Oh, yeah. yeah. So if you know, if you notice in the picture, I made a point. I, I like to use words to kind of tease at things without being like too prescriptive. So in that picture, you know, you said it's like to try trying and review. You know, so. If I'm understanding the question is like, back to this idea of working small, we always have to think about how we're integrating our understanding back into the world, right? And so the, the reason why I put to try, trying and review is this idea, it's to do, doing and done suggests that everything in the to-do column needs to be to do, right? It needs to be done. So the idea of to try, trying and review here is just to remind people that, um, really we have to consider a lot of options and experiments as we chase down this particular thing. But here's something that is important to keep in mind that like, there are big thorny architectural projects that are highly, highly valuable for a company. And they are, you know, 12 to 18 months worth of work and a lot of people's time. And the important thing again, is to be contextual in that thing. Are, are you gonna be to try, trying and whatever? Maybe not. But is it really important in a large architectural effort to like integrate your understanding and reduce risk and see if there's ways to provide incremental value and to test your assumptions? Absolutely. So you can apply that think big, work small to not just this idea of like lean startup or tiny little experiments. I mean, really, it's about a direction and a mindset versus, you know, like precise guidelines of what an iteration is or how often you're iterating. How does product discovery oh, play yeah. in this? Cool. Yeah, I like questions like this. So, yeah, I, I've i seen a lot of these actual folks sort of say things like, um, you know, just start. You don't need to do any of this research up front. You don't, you know, just, just get going. You know, you'll never know anything until you put working code into the hands of the customer. Now, given my UX research background, I can say that that is categorically categorically false, right? Like there's many types of learning. I think what they're getting at is the the bias to try to solve everything through research without necessarily getting something in front of them. But what we're what we're starting to see now is the pendulum swings, you know? So before it was like, oh, you know, big design up front is terrible. Why would we ever do that? We just have to get started. You know, we've never put anything in production. And now you get the pendulum swinging to the other side where, you know, people like Lisa at Atlassian is sort of telling me, she's like, can we, can we just sort of like, can we let the, can we let some researchers do what they really do really, really well? Like, are we really content to just iterate to nowhere? 
on this stuff. And so I think that back to the product discovery thing, I always, the thing I do with the team is what's the learning backlog? You know, what do we need to learn here? And start with the why, not the way. So start with the why that we need to learn these things and then get to the way. Maybe research is the right thing for that thing, but maybe for that other thing, putting it into production tomorrow is the right thing. But, but too often teams are very dogmatic. Like they're either like, we must do extensive research before every effort. Um, and on other things, it must like, we must get something into production in two days. And really you're not using a contextually appropriate approach before you do that. So if you start with a learning backlog, you prioritize what you have to learn, you bring that into in progress. And then you ask, given what we know, what's the, what's the best approach for this? And it might be three months of UX research and it might be three hours of development time to get something in production. It's just, it's just you have to start with what you need to learn. There's another one about safe. Interesting take on safe. I wonder what's been the goal of those organizations that have attempted those. I, I, I just think it's so hard to second guess. I mean, you know, my, my, my partner works at a, you know, a couple thousand person company. And so for the last eight months during the pandemic, I've had to hear her talking and she said to hear me talking. Um, and, you know, you know, the, the, the board is putting an incredible amount of pressure on them to quote unquote, we may hate the words transformation or digital transformation, or we may think it's all played out or whatever, but you're hearing the board say, oh my God, we've run out of stuff in stock. And, you know, we, you're the digital channels are on fire and like, you have to take, make massive investments in the tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars range to be able to put this stuff into motion. So back to the motivations around people around safe. It's like, I think that unless you've sat in the shoes of someone who's having to figure out how to spend 50 million or hundred million dollars to get this kind of outcome that it's safe. Now, of course, you'd argue that if you work at a consultancy, you want to make a hundred million dollars, by all means promote safe. So, like, <laughs> so I don't know, like, yeah. The motivations, they're humans and they're under intense amount of pressure and their organizations have an, an immense amount of inertia behind them. So it's very hard to second guess that, I think. Cool. Um, so that we are going to start wrapping up. So, John, uh, the last thing I have for you is if people are out there listening, whether they're work big, work small, whether they're a defined big, work small, or they are just killing it with product. If there are two words, maybe three words that you can just leave with the audience on like how they're working or something to think about, mm. do you have a couple words to leave people with? Yeah, wow. It's maybe tough. maybe just a small image of the customer to safe and remember that <laughs> to remember the no I mean you should you should remember the customer but I mean one thing that I work a lot with the teams is just just building shared language in your company is a start you know so so often you'll meet a product team and I'll say well could you describe the different sort of shapes of work or the type of work you're working on and they'll say oh there's only three types you know there's performance thing they use cano model or there's delighters or whatever and I was like is it do you treat all the work the same way is like are these strategically all important the same way and they'll say well no no it's the three categories we use to do things so the one of the bits of advice is like I've never walked into a company that had less than like 15 shapes of work you know there's the and there's the big thorny architectural efforts. There's the other things. There's the tiny little optimizers. So the, the first thing that anyone can do is just call the kettle black and build shared language and stop, stop like oversimplifying <laughs> because it comes back and bites you. If, yeah. if, if you're working in, a, in this sort of rich environment, then just call it what it is. So that would be one thing. Shared language gets you a start for anything. And then you can call things um, what you're talking about. I think that the other thing would kind of go back to the leading with the why, not the way, where, geez, I've had so much better success just not mentioning the word agile or digital or anything like that. Like, it's not, these are all, for, for the executive or whoever, the minute you just get typecast as the agile person or the OKR person or the whatever person, and that's just not where you want to be. You don't, because then it's easy to attack you. 
it's easy to say, well, that person's really dogmatic. All they keep talking about is agile or all they keep talking about are lean or all they keep talking about is like the Dora DevOps report or, you know, they, they just care about that. And so I think that that's one of these things where if you just remove the language, yeah. like remove all the ways that you talk about and really try to become sort of a savvy business person in this and thinking about, you know, what, what is the threat to the business? What are the opportunities here? And how am I, what am I going to do? How is what I'm going to do going to um, contribute to sustainable, differentiated, mid to long-term growth of the company? And like in, in lieu of that, people always go to short-term goals. In lieu of outcomes, everyone will opt for the year-long roadmap. In lieu of any, if in lieu of anything tangible progress, which is kind of the think big, work small, in lieu of that tangible progress and those outcomes, everyone will default to the most dysfunctional um, <laughs> approaches, the next best thing, the proxy metric or whatever. So, so yeah, I would think that that kind of like lead with the why and what you're doing here, and just leave the words out of it. You'll probably be, you know, better off. I would say. Cool. Well, John, it has been an absolute pre pl a pleasure. So thank you so much for joining us. I think we had a blast talking about story points in December and super happy to have you back. Um, so, and everyone, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the questions. Follow John on Twitter at Cuddle, John, cut, at John Cuttlefish, right, John? Is that, is that That's, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, follow him on LinkedIn. You can go to Amplitude. They have some webinars coming up on March 2nd. They have a driving product-led growth through collaboration. And on March 3rd, they have a product strategy webinar. And we will be back next month with a new talk, uh, most likely led by Susie, our head of DevOps. Um, also, don't forget to sign up for Summit 2021, formerly Atlassian Summit. You can go on and register today. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly. That was great. Yep, thank you. Bye, everyone.